The Insidious Dr. Fu Manchu, written by Sax Rahmer, narrated by Edward E. French. Chapter 19. I've never seen a man quite so surprised as Inspector Weymouth. This is absolutely incredible, he said. There's only one door to your chambers. We found it bolted from the inside. Yes, groaned West, pressing his hand to his forehead. I bolted it myself at eleven o'clock when I came in. No human being could climb up or down your windows. The plans of the aero torpedo were inside a safe. I put them there myself, said West, on returning from the war office, and I had occasion to consult them after I'd come in and bolted the door. I returned them to the safe and locked it. That it was still locked, you saw for yourselves. And no one else in the world knows the combination. But the plans have gone, said Weymouth. It's magic. How was it done? What happened last night, sir? What did you mean when you rang us up? Smith, during this colloquy, was pacing rapidly up and down the room. He turned abruptly to the aviator. "'Every fact you can remember, Mr. West, please,' he said tersely, "'and be as brief as you possibly can.' "'Well, I I came in, as I said,' explained West, uh, "'about eleven o'clock, and having made some notes relating to an interview arranged for this morning, "'I locked the plans in the safe and turned in.' "'There was no one hidden anywhere in your chambers?' snapped Smith." There was not, replied West. I I looked, I I invariably do. Almost immediately I went to sleep. How many chloral tabloids did you take? I interrupted. Norris West turned to me with a slow smile. (laughs) You're cute, doctor, he said. I took two. It's a bad habit, but I can't sleep without. They're specially made up for me by a firm in Philadelphia. How long sleep lasted, when it became filled with uncanny dreams, and when those dreams merged into reality, I do not know, shall never know, I suppose. But out of the dreamless void, a face came to me, closer, closer, and peered into mine. I was in that curious condition, wherein one knows that one is dreaming and seeks to awaken, to escape. But a nightmare-like oppression held me. So I must lie and gaze into the seared yellow face that hung over me, for it would drop so close that I could trace the cicatrized scar running from the left ear to the corner of the mouth and drawing up the lip like the lip of a snarling cur. I could look into the malignant, jauntest eyes. I could hear the dim whispering of the distorted mouth, whispering that seemed to counsel something, something evil. That whispering intimacy was indescribably repulsive. Then the wicked yellow face would be withdrawn and would recede until it became as a pin's head in the darkness far above me, almost like a glutinous, liquid thing. Somehow I got to my feet, or dreamed I did. God knows where dreaming ended and reality began. Gentlemen, you'll conclude I went mad last night, but as I stood holding on to the bed rail, I heard the blood throbbing through my arteries like a noise, like a screw propeller. (laughs) I started laughing. The laughter issued from my lips with a shrill whistling sound that pierced me with physical pain and seemed to wake the echoes of the whole block. I thought myself I was going mad, and I tried to command my will to break the power of the chloral for I concluded that I had accidentally taken an overdose. Then the walls of my bedroom started to recede, till at last I stood holding on to a bed, which had shrunk to the size of a doll's cot in the middle of a room like Trafalgar Square. That window yonder was such a long way off, I could scarcely see it, but I could just detect a Chinaman, the owner of the evil yellow face, creeping through it. He was followed by another, who was enormously tall, so tall that as they came towards me, and it seemed to take them something like half an hour to cross this incredible apartment in my dream, the second Chinaman seemed to tower over me like a cypress tree. I looked up to his face, his wicked hairless face, Mr. Smith. Whatever age I live to, I'll never forget that face I I saw last night. Or did I see it? God knows the pointed chin, the great dome of a forehead, and the eyes. Heavens above, the huge green eyes. He shook like a sick man, and I glanced at Smith significantly. 
Inspector Weymouth was stroking his mustache, and his mingled expression of incredulity and curiosity was singular to behold. The pumping of my blood, continued West, seemed to be bursting my body. The room kept expanding and contracting, and one time the ceiling would be pressing down on my head, and the Chinamen, sometimes I thought there were two of them, sometimes twenty, became dwarves. The next instant it shot up like the roof of a cathedral. Can I be awake? I whispered. Or am I dreaming? My whisper went sweeping in windy echoes about the walls and was lost in the shadowy distances up under the invisible roof. You are dreaming. Yes. It was the Chinaman with the green eyes who was addressing me, and the words that he uttered appeared to occupy an immeasurable time in the utterance. But at will, I can render the subjective objective. I don't think I can have dreamed those singular words, gentlemen. And then he fixed the green eyes upon me, the blazing green eyes. I made no attempt to move. They seemed to be draining me of something vital, bleeding me of every drop of mental power. The whole nightmare room grew green, and I felt that I was being absorbed into the greenness. <laughs> I can see what you think, and even in my delirium, if it was delirium, I thought the same. Now comes the climax of my experience, my vision, I don't know what else to call it. I saw some words issuing from my own mouth. Inspector Weymouth coughed discreetly. Smith whisked round upon him. "'This will be outside your experience, Inspector, I know,' he said. "'But Mr. Norris West's statement does not surprise me in the least. "'I know to what the experience was due.' "'Weymouth stared incredulously, but a dawning perception of the truth was come to me, too. "'How I saw a sound I just won't attempt to explain. "'I simply tell you I saw it. "'Somehow I knew I had betrayed myself, given something away. "'You gave away the secret of the lock combination.' rapped Smith. "'Eh?' grunted Weymouth. But West went on hoarsely. Just before the blank came, a name flashed before my eyes. It was Bayard Taylor. At that I interrupted West. "'I understand,' I cried. "'I understand. Another name has just occurred to me, Mr. West, that of the Frenchman, Moreau.' "'You have solved the mystery,' said Smith. "'It was natural Mr. West should have thought of the American traveller Bayard Taylor, though. "'Moreau's book is purely scientific. He's probably never read it.' "'I fought with the stupor that was overcoming me,' continued West, "'striving to associate that vaguely familiar name with the fantastic things through which I moved. "'It, it seemed to me that the room was empty again. "'I made for the hall, for the telephone.' I could scarcely drag my feet along. It seemed to take me half an hour to get there. I remember calling up Scotland Yard, and I remember no more. There was a short, tense interval. In some respects, I was nonplussed. Frankly, I think Inspector Weymouth considered West insane. Smith, his hands locked behind his back, stared out of the window. Anderman second, he said suddenly. Weymouth, when is the first train to Tilbury? 522 from French Church Street, replied the Scotland Yard man promptly. Too late, rapped my friend. Jump in a taxi and pick up two good men to leave for China at once. Then go and charter a special to Tilbury and leave in 25 minutes. Order a cab to wait outside for me. Weymouth was palpably amazed, but Smith's tone was imperative. The inspector departed hastily. I stared at Smith, not comprehending what prompted this singular course. Now that you can think clearly, Mr. West, he said, of what does your experience remind you? The errors of perception regarding time, the idea of seeing a sound, the illusion that the room alternately increased and diminished in size, your fit of laughter, and the recollection of the name Bayard Taylor, since evidently you are familiar with that author's work. The land of the Saracen, is it not? These symptoms of the attack should be familiar, I think. Norris West pressed his hands to his evidently aching head. Baird Taylor's book, he said dully. Yes, I know of what my brain sought to remind me. Taylor's account of his experience under hashish. Mr. Smith, someone doped me with hashish. Smith nodded grimly. 
Cannabis in Dicker, I said. Indian hemp, that is what you were drugged with. I have no doubt that you now experience a feeling of nausea and intense thirst, with aching in the muscles, particularly the deltoid. I think you must have taken at least 15 grams. Smith stopped his perambulations immediately in front of West, looking into his dulled eyes. "'Someone visited your chambers last night,' he said slowly, "'and for your chloral tabloids substituted some containing hashish, "'or perhaps not pure hashish. "'Fu Manchu is a profound chemist.' "'Norris West started. "'Someone uh, substituted,' he began. "'Exactly,' said Smith, looking at him keenly. "'Someone who was here yesterday. "'Have you any idea whom it could have been?' "'West hesitated.' Uh, I, <clears throat> I had a visitor in the afternoon, he said, seemingly speaking the words unwillingly. But a lady, jerked Smith. I suggest that it was a lady. West nodded. You're quite right, he admitted. I don't know how you arrived at the conclusion, but a lady whose acquaintance I made recently, a, a foreign lady, Karamani, snapped Smith. I don't know what you mean in the least, but she came here, knowing this to be my present address, to ask me to protect her from a mysterious man who had followed her right from Charing Cross. She said he was down in the lobby, and naturally I asked her to wait here whilst I went and sent him about his business. He laughed shortly. <laughs> I'm over old, he said, to be guided by a woman. You spoke just now of someone called Fu Manchu. Is that the crook I'm indebted to for the loss of my plans? I've had attempts made by agents of two European governments, but a Chinaman's a novelty. This Chinaman, Smith assured him, is the greatest novelty of his age. You recognize your symptoms now from Bayard Taylor's account? Mr. West's statement, I said, ran closely parallel with portions of Moreau's book on hashish hallucinations. Only Fu Manchu, I think, would have thought of employing Indian hemp. I doubt, though, if it was pure cannabis indica. At any rate, it acted as an opiate. And drugged Mr. West, interrupted Smith, sufficiently to enable Fu Manchu to enter unobserved. Whilst it produced symptoms which rendered him an easy subject for the doctor's influence. It is difficult in this case to separate hallucination from reality, but I think, Mr. West, that Fu Manchu must have exercised an hypnotic influence upon your drugged brain. We've evidence that he dragged from you the secret of the combination. God knows we have, said West. But who is this Fu Manchu, and how, how in the name of wonder did he get into my chambers? Smith pulled out his watch. That, he said rapidly, I cannot delay to explain if I'm to intercept the man who has the plans. Come along, Petrie. We must be at Tilbury within the hour. There is just a bare chance. 